Have you ever wanted to be a professional athlete playing rugby or soccer or baseball or gridiron, whatever it might be, or even have you dreamt of representing your country at something? This week's Fireside is all about being a professional sportsman or woman. And we're going to be talking very shortly to a very good friend of mine, Mark Stabina, who represented Australia at the elite level in rugby union. He actually won a bronze medal in the Commonwealth Games and has played rugby for the, some of the top teams around the world. Mark will be sharing his story and more importantly giving tips and gems of wisdom for you guys so you can take that away and apply it to your own journey. Thank you so much for being here. We really hope you enjoy it and we appreciate your support. Thank you. Stabby, how are you buddy? Fantastic Sebastian. <laughs> I'm so excited. Well thanks for coming in. I, we're just starting to do in-person ones uh, and it's a pleasure to have you. I think it's, I mean, any opportunity to work with you, support you, riff with you, I grab it with both hands. Thank you. So Mark Stabina, schoolboy rugby prodigy, oh. uh, Commonwealth Games bronze medalist. Um, you are an elite athlete. You've represented Australia at rugby. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And you're very humble about it. So which is what I'm, I'm loving that you're open to talking about your career, I suppose, and imparting gifts because it's a very common Bucket list item. A lot of kids want to right? grow up to be a professional rugby player, NFL player, basketball player, mm -hmm. swimmer, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a lot of learning here. Happy to provide some uh, insight from my experience. Well, first question, I always ask this. Mm -hmm. What was it that first got you to understand? When did you first realise rugby? I like this. What happened? Well, as you know, Seb, growing up in Australia, very sport dominated sports-centric culture. So sport was all around. School, it was out in the backyard, the front yard, the road. And in my particular area of Sydney, rugby was popular. Not necessarily the code of rugby. We might talk about that a little later, but it was rugby league. There's two different codes for people that are watching and don't really understand. But in Australia, you can play one or the other. The one that was professional was rugby league. And I'm not surprised that a lot of people want to be professional athletes with what they see on TV. So rugby league was what I saw on TV as a kid growing up. I uh -huh. supported my local team. So from a young age, I pretended to be some of these heroes in the backyard. I would, I would call myself, I would actually commentate, which is another funny thing. If we Of course, <laughs> of course we'll get there. <laughs> so I would pretend I'm the commentator calling out my name and, and of my sport hero and I pretend to be them. That would be from three years old, I think, uh, just from what I see and what I hear the adults talk about, uh, talking about the sport on the weekend. And then I started at five uh, in the under sixes mm -hmm. for the, the Cronulla Carringbar uh, Sharks. I think they were the Sharks. It was a long time ago. Organised sports, big, even for kids. Now, back then, I'm and sure this it's rugby league. Rugby league. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> So I think back then it might have changed. They've modified it since then, but it was full contact. It was full. We were making full on tackles at you know at five years old, at five or six years old. So was it at that point you thought this is it? Because no. there's ambition, and then there's talent, and then of course there's hard work. But what was the moment you do? You remember a specific moment where you're like, I love this. I'm five years old, getting bashed <laughs> around. A was it that, or was it when you scored a first try, or was it when you were a little older and you went this? Again, it wasn't necessarily. When I participated, I, there's two things that come to mind. Um, when, I was, when I would go to the stadium as a kid and watch, mm. and back in those days we were allowed to run on the field afterwards and we could go up and we could pat mm. our sporting hero on the back and feel the sweat and you wouldn't wash that hand for a week. Obviously things have changed right now. You mm. know, we need to wash our hands. But back then I wouldn't wash my hands. I'd get all dirty on the grass, pretend that I played – that's at those, those, not one particular moment, but those, that period of time between the ages of six to eight and 10, and I'd go and watch these guys play. I want to be here one day. I mean, I pretended I was. Yeah. So it was in my head that I'm going to be here one day. And then I think it became more of a reality as I got older. Mm. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But when I was playing rugby in high school. Yeah. Uh, because there tends to be a drop-off. It's like sure. that's where – and you see how you develop physically. Uh, you might pick up other interests. I still was maintaining my sporting interests and achieving accolades, and then it got to a point where it's like now I'm starting to be scouted, and that's when it became a reality. So Interesting. Mm -hmm. So kind of – so I suppose the question is, so you, you, you had a love for it. 
you then grew into it. You had talent. You were being recognized for talent. Do you set a goal in there? I want to be a professional athlete. It sounds as though you kind of did that subconsciously when you were younger. Mm -hmm. Then the opportunity came and you just let it go. How much of it is a decision on your end and how much of it is allowing things to happen? Well, and for and for some, I need to throw a third option in. How much of that is is other people's expectations? Sure. And feeling the need to fulfill those. Yeah. We see it all the time with parents and athletes wanting to please their parents and their parents pushing them yeah. to fit into a certain sport or play the sport that they played and carry on in their shoes. And that can be very damaging without going into that. But that wasn't the case for me, fortunately. It was more about, um, yeah, just it, it, it was organic. It yeah. was organic. Yeah. The support is interesting. The support is important. You yeah. need people around you. We, we do a lot of these firesides around different bucket mm-hmm. list areas and mm-hmm. support seems to be something that's just really important, even for development as a human. Mm. It's good to have family and friends, peers, colleagues, yeah. schoolmates. It is, and, and and particularly team sport, which which was predominantly what I did. I did some track and field, and that supported my team sport. Mm. But uh, it was it was predominantly team sports, which already has an inbuilt support structure. When you think about it, you have your teammates. Yep. I, I can only imagine at elite individual sports how that can be different, um, and and possibly a lot more pressure. But the support structure is important. And when you're young, that's where you can really be shaped in terms of what support did you get from your parents and your um, mm. immediate family, maybe siblings. Uh, I had an older sister. She was obviously supportive and played sport herself. But what was great about my support was that my parents showed up. Sure. They turned up. They watched whenever they could mm. without telling me you need to do this. They would encourage me. But if at any stage I'm like, I remember swimming, squad swimming. Mm. <laughs> you saw me swim. So, but as a kid, it was like I did everything and I was doing, I was getting up at six in the morning and doing swimming. And yeah. my mum was driving me to do that six in the morning. She's like, yeah. all right. And I, I said, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not enjoying swimming and watching a black line. And she was like, okay, great. Where can I take you? So it seems, so how fantastic you had a family to support you. Mm. It seems that support is crucial. But not everyone has it, yep. yeah, and especially when it comes to individual sports. Sometimes I I, I, I hear a lot that you know a, a kid wants to do whatever the sport is, but the parents don't want to support, or mm. they don't know anyone who does it. Do you do you have any? Maybe maybe you don't, but do you have any advice for those people? Because if if we can if we can assume that support's needed and you don't have any, how do you go out and find people to help you? Is it right? You know, is it just getting inspiration online perhaps or becoming part of a – I don't want to answer the question. I'm just mm-hmm. guessing. But yeah. do you, what do you think? Well, it's interesting you say when you don't receive the support, and, and, and that could be a number of different ways. Uh, perhaps if there's no parents around, that can happen as well. Single parents just busy, busy working and making ends meet. So, you know, they're not able to t- attend, mm. and, and that's understandable. Um, the tricky one is when you, your parents are present – but they don't condone what you're doing. They want you to do something else. Sure. Or they, if you choose to do this silly sport and you think you're going to get paid for it, then you're on your own. Mm. That's tough. Um, My advice would be uh, rather than rebel, and it's always hard, especially as a young person, is communicate how much it means to you Yep. um, and that you want to do that. Failing that, then you seek mentorship. I know you want to talk about mentors, but... Mentorship's important even at a young age, and that's where I think coaches play a mm. massive role. Yep. Coaches, older players or older athletes in your chosen sport or field, yep. and, and just getting curious and seeking support and information from them. Seeking it out, being so, proactive. Yeah, and, and again, that's, that is difficult for people that, are, that tend to be shy. Mm. Again, I understand that. But I'm offering this now is break through that as young as you can and know that if you have a genuine goal and desire to be a professional sports person or at least play your sport Mm. at an elite level, then support is crucial, as you said. Mm. And if it doesn't come to you automatically or naturally, 
go out and find it. And it's I love everywhere. Yeah. I, we keep on, I keep saying it every fireside, actually, but we keep on, whether it's acting or script writing or surfing or mm-hmm. adventuring or being a professional athlete, rugby player, people out there are wanting, people who have gone through the process are wanting to help people who are coming up. And that support is always there. You've just got to find it. Mm-hmm. Because, I, I, and I suppose moving on from that a second, so say you have the support suddenly and you start, you know, throwing your wares at trying to become a professional athlete playing for that team or making a certain level or what have you. Um, there's going to be self-doubt. Mm-hmm. We all experience that. Mm-hmm. Um, did you experience it? How do you cope with it? And, and, and I guess just as importantly, what advice do you suggest? Because, you know, I used to play rugby. You know, I didn't make it to your level. Um, and I had a lot of self-doubt. Um, and, yeah, I think it's something that's very prevalent. H- how do you sort of start to address that in the mind without getting into the weeds of psychology? Because I know I'm not a psychologist. Well, neither Maybe am I. Are. Neither am I. Uh, and, and I know a lot more now having, having studied that so I can help people through that. At the time, not necessarily, but it's great to be able to reflect and see what I lacked and where I lacked it and, and mm. if I knew then what I know what I know now, but I can help people through that. And when I when I reflect on the self doubt, absolutely. Absolutely there was self doubt and it's that is par for the course. That is going to happen and and especially in a team sport, one of the hardest things for let's say a rugby player mm. or anybody that's playing in a team is selection. Yep. So you learn pretty early on uh, the pain, the anguish, and the elation of selection day. Mm. And progressing up into then when you become professional, but I guess we're talking about the process to get there, but when you become professional, then it becomes your livelihood. Mm. So it adds another element to it. It's like, I don't get selected this week, I get paid less. Yeah. That's, or they don't renew my contract, I don't get paid at all unless someone else gives me a contract. But we can we can go into that. We will go into that. Okay. We will. Because I, I find that, you know, the, the, the idea that something that's always been a passion then turning into a profession livelihood, there must be so much transition. And I, and I will ask you about okay. that. But back to the question, sorry. To yeah. answer it, if there's something I can, I can offer in dealing early on with the inevitable self-doubt, mm. well, there's some... Uh, superstars and superhuman beings out there that just they're always confident mm. uh I, I i'd even i'd even reckon that they get self-doubt from time to time sure. um <clears throat> it's just it's just that knowing and acceptance early on that like this is going to be part of the sport mm. and ask yourself the question knowing that am i up for it yep and 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 can i Will I be okay with not always winning the trophy, not always being selected on the first team, not yep. always? And it's good to just ask yourself that question and then get used to it, get used to it, get used to it. Now, when that actually happens, now you have to deal with the disappointment. So all I would say to that is keep going. Remember your goal. You asked about goals before. Mm. Yes. So set yourself a goal and and just know that it takes time. Mm. Be patient and use it as fuel. Yep. So early on, I, I use this phrase growth mindset. And you can even you can teach kids this. And I think we should be teaching kids what a growth mindset is. Mm. And that means that we embrace and we focus on the process of getting better every day. Sure. Not focusing on the outcome, but did you, are you better than yesterday? Good. If not, how can I be better? How can we turn the disappointments not being not being selected, losing the grand final by a point mm. on the whistle. Uh, it's learning from early on how to turn that disappointment into opportunity, mm. opportunity, opportunity. And the younger you can learn that, you're setting yourself up for a great, successful life, not just a sporting career. Yeah, that's great advice. And what's interesting also to me is, <clears throat> so you have these kind of external events, not getting picked getting beaten at the whistle, um, having a form, a form slump, or maybe it's not you, it's there's just an incredible team you're against or an individual you're up against. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess the question is, how does someone keep themselves accountable to be working as hard as they need to be to keep themselves at the top of their game um, when you know, th- th- there's a term, I, I might butcher this, but it's something like um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Mm. Meaning that, there is a balance between having 
raw talent mm-hmm. um, and working incredibly hard. And I, and I think there's this misperception that some people are just gifted and they're going to win. Uh, they're the, uh, but it's not quite true, I don't think. What, what, what are your thoughts on the hard work that's needed? How do you yeah. throw yourself? Do you agree? I'm living proof of that. Yeah, I would say that I'm, uh, to be honest about my abilities and my achievements, a lot of that was on the back of, there were way more talented players than me. Uh, and, and in most of the professional teams I played for, I was less of the raw talent um, player that just was, was, was uh, oozing with flair and skill and I was more of a solid player that got the job done mm. and that's because I worked, I worked and worked. There was a point, when you're young, what tends to happen is you'll shine above the rest when you, there's early kind of signs of yeah. this kid's got some talent better than everyone around him depending on your environment and then you get to older levels and if as you start getting selected for representative teams which is like players coming from larger areas into one team now mm. you start to see wow they're they're good they're good they're good <laughs> now it's like now i have to start it's not just my talent that's going to get me through um there will be some people that 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 will and rely on their talent but even then that's not foolproof i've seen extremely talented players mm. that the most skillful fastest unbelievable athletes you'll ever see mm. that do not make it in, in a specific team. They might make it in another team, but they, they weren't a fit because they didn't work hard enough. Their work ethic was a problem. Their attitude toward being a team player was a problem. Mm. And um, they weren't constantly refining and, and working on their skills to suit the team's needs right. and suit the game plan. They might. It also just might be that they just turn up late, they get cut, they're gone. Sure. So there's certain there's the hard work definitely, and and in my case, it was more often hard work, uh, and 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 that growth mindset of just always mm. being better, that kind of got me on the team as like this guy's reliable. Yep, he can do some good stuff every Fantastic. now and then. This guy over here does some amazing stuff, but he also does some. He has a brain explosion from time to time. Yep. We're going to go with Stabina because we know he can get the job done. I know that was definitely... Yeah. And, and again, you're so humble about this. And I, I just want to you know, reiterate, you played at the highest level. You played for Australia sure. in rugby union. Mm. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. And, you know, for rugby, it doesn't. Thank you're you, a bronze medalist at the Commonwealth Games. <laughs> Um, there it is. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know what the Commonwealth Games are, Which it's like the Olympics. Most Americans. Yeah, but yeah. for the Commonwealth um, country. For it's Commonwealth. phenomenal. Mm. Um, so, okay. So what you said there was brilliant. I, I like that all these people who are talented, but they didn't work hard enough and they had the wrong attitude. Mm-hmm. Which kind of makes me start thinking about the sacrifices that you and people wanting to launch themselves into you know, this ambition of becoming a professional athlete and their, mm-hmm. their favourite sport. What sacrifices do you have to make? When it comes to personal uh, lifestyle, social friends you hang out with, work, money, location potentially, like mm. is is everything just if if your one goal is to make it to the top, do you have to make kind of a you know do you have to have an agreement with yourself which is I'm going to do anything that has to that, that's mm. going to get me closer to that goal? What would mm. or uh, is it maybe more of a natural thing? This is really this is a great question and really interesting because. 10 years ago, I might have told you, oh, you have to just sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. It's not for long. Do whatever it takes to get to the top and you'll get there more often than not. My attitude's changed a little bit, having gone through it, having transitioned and looking back on the sport. Yes, that's important. And without a doubt, to our point before, without the hard work and discipline, Mm. you'll soon find out that talent can only get you so far. Um, so yes, there's that agreement and, and it comes back to like from as young an age as possible. Is this what I really want? And, and if, if it's really my passion, then keep connecting to that and go for it, knowing that along the way you will have to make sacrifices. When you get to pro sport, depending on your sport and depending on the environment and the needs imposed by the coaches and trainers, you will have to meet certain criteria mm. and there's no way around it. You might be naturally gifted to have it. For a lot of people, 
they have to work to achieve mm. the certain levels or maintain it. You might have it, but you can easily fall away if you yep. get complacent. So, yes. Um, again, a little different, Sebastian, on the sport. Not to go too much into sure. it, but there are subtle differences. If it's an individual sport, it's you competing against others and it's it's really just fine-tuning and, and focusing on, on your strengths and your game and, and figuring out a way that, that you can get on top of your other opponent. The team sports has a different element because mm. we're talking about what sacrifices am I making uh, and what I was saying before about my attitudes change a little bit toward just sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice because I think it is important to also enjoy what you're doing. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. This is, I've just had this <laughs> in my mind for the last 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I know where you're going to go and we'll go there because that – just sacrificing and focusing on solely on your sport and your discipline can lead to burnout. Mm. And it's, I've seen it time and time again also. Yep. When you stop enjoying what you're doing, then all the hard work and the discipline and the sacrifice becomes meaningless. And then you might end up rebelling against it or, or yep. just completely – emotionally and mentally burning out and physically for that matter and, and not being able to keep up with the demands. And we, we hear and see this a lot in elite performers who are world famous. I, yeah. I've been contacted by quite a few telling me, hey, sure. I remember reading their name and going, I can't believe this person's telling me this. But there's burnout, swimmers particularly, um, mm. or maybe there's a big group, but definitely swimmers, um, because the training is immense. Gymnasts too, their bodies are from a young age just told to do things which aren't normal yeah. by default um yeah so that's so okay so my question and we kind of touched on it earlier is how does that transition what are some tips you have let me say this question again mm -hmm. the transition from playing a sport for fun something that you love that you were you used to run on the rugby field as a youngster you mm -hmm. played in the backyard the front yard on the road you mm -hmm. mentioned dangerous um the transition into then professionalism where there's politics, yep. there is, there's money, there's livelihood, you mentioned earlier. There are decisions for an organization with impact economies, mm -hmm. you know, all these things. Mm -hmm. how, how do you maintain your, the fun and the love of a sport when in the professional stage of your career, it seems almost anything but fun, especially when you're making, having to make large sacrifices. How did you do Did you come across a time where you were like, am I having fun? And how did you deal with that? The, absolutely. The main one for me that kind of uh, gets in the way of the fun are the injuries. Ah. You talk about, uh, and, and, and when you say when you were a child, when you, you know, when you played it for the love of the sport, it's very common that that attitude or perspective is introduced into a team that is suffering burnout, a team or individuals. We always often go back to, let's remember when we used to play this for fun. Mm. Right? It's, 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 you hear it so often, and it is true, but it's easier said than done. So when you play pro, you think about it when you're a kid and you're having fun, you don't really get injured. And your body's built for, depending if it's a contact sport or not, but let's say it's not, you, your 12-year-old, 13-year-old body can just can run all day, can handle everything, you you're not really straining your hamstrings. Yeah. You're not doing weight training for one. Mend quickly. You mend quickly. You just want to get back out there. Bruises are fine, you know. Um, and you're more often than not playing against other little people. <laughs> when you get to the pros and you start playing against some monsters, oh, yeah. and the moment you step into the gym and you're required to put some muscle on your frame, um, more flexibility, you start forming imbalances yeah. in your body especially if you're not doing it correctly. So that's another thing I would offer is take that seriously. Get curious and learn about your body and follow and cross your T's and dot your I's when it comes to strength and conditioning because your body goes through changes. Sure. And then it's managing injuries. That's the biggest challenge is when you get injured, that's when you are faced with uh, like I said, the 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 mindset, the growth mindset of recovery is like Okay, now I'm 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 injured. How do I manage the disappointment of that? Where are the opportunities in this? Without going into it, it's let's just call it injury management is one of the ways. And when you get injured and injured and injured and injured, mm. 
the fun starts to get sucked right out of it. Yeah. So there were times, I mean, I had, I had eight surgeries yep. over the course of my career, and the last one, as you know, being a broken neck. Yeah. So, uh, but before that, you know, I had I had a couple of shoulder reconstructions that kept me out for eight months. Yeah. And the the the, the strains of the hamstrings and the quads and the soft t- tissue injuries. Um, again, when I look back on it, I'm able to turn those disappointments into well, look at the resilience I've built and the character that I've built through that, that I can apply in my life sure. today, COVID, you know? Mm-hmm. So, the, but back in, back at that time, yes, what I would, this, the advice I would offer is, again, just know that it's going to be part of it and prepare yourself accordingly and, sure. and learn about your body and, and ask your physiotherapists questions and your trainers and, tr- I mean, really get to know this this miracle of a vehicle that we have that is essential for your sport Mm. and also not just the outside but the inside so it's nutrition everybody knows this to a degree how important that is when it comes to fueling and making this machine as as efficient as possible but the emotional and mental side is huge when it comes to management of that because as you say you've been we'll talk about your injury in a second Mm -hmm. but in fact maybe now's the perfect time you broke your neck it stopped your career. Yeah, that has sent many people, and I, you know, I know some of your friends, in, into the worst of places mm. in a depressive state. Mm. Um, and for you, it wasn't that. So, as you know, and I, I'm hoping that there are people watching who have, you know, kids going, "Oh, I want to play rugby for whoever or whatever the sport might be." Um, there is, of course, life has hurdles and resistance and mm. all these things, and so that mindset that you talk of seems crucial. Mm. You almost you you were a, a paraplegic or something for a moment, weren't you? Or almost quadriplegic. Quadriplegic. I mean, I I could say I was. I, I don't know if you could say I was officially a quadriplegic, right. but I, I I basically had no feeling in my body from the neck down for about twenty five minutes. Wow. Scary twenty five minutes, yep. as you can imagine. Mm. So yes, that moment was was life defining, Seb. It was. But and you saw opportunity in there, even. And it's funny, yeah, because I tell people this. Because they can't, some people can't fathom it. Some people can, unfortunately. Some people have gone through way worse and unfortunately haven't come out of it walking the way that I did. So I know how lucky I am. And it's even funny in that period of time, that 25 minutes where I couldn't feel a thing. It was so foreign to me. I've been injured before, but this was, I don't, I've never experienced a neck injury. So mm-hmm. there was that kind of my brain's like, what's going on? What is this? Mm-hmm. Shock set in. Mm-hmm. There was some panic. And then once the medical staff got some oxygen on me to calm me down and, and, and lure me out of that sort of shock period, now I'm, it's me with me that still can't feel a thing, that can't move. I'm strapped to a st- stretcher. Uh, I Even through injury and learning how to manage injury and, and adopting this kind of opportunities mm. over obstacles mindset, my mind was like, well, you can, you can compete in the Paralympics. It's, it's all good. Right. It's all good. Like... We'll get ramps in my house. I just done up my house. I started to imagine the floor plan of my house. Like that's where my mind went. Right. I, then it sharply went to my life's over. I know it sure. because clearly this is this is pretty heavy. Uh, but it's interesting to me that that was just something that was inherent in me from practice. Mm. By the way, from mm. being injured. So we. Don't want to with that story. Don't want to turn people off pursuing yeah, their dreams. That's a. Gnarly injury, of course, but it's not common. It happens, but more so there's, all, there's resistance. There are hurdles, there are things of that nature that will slow us and impact us, and it's all about prepping the mind, which I'm, is what I'm hearing. I'm pretty sure that people, this is an organised professional sport, or even when it's not professional, it's organised sport and there's always medical staff. I'd be willing to bet there are so many more people that get injured on their vacation doing sure. silly stuff and, and not being around support like that so if that's going to ease someone's mind of like oh well, I'll, I'll, i don't want to get that injured i shouldn't play sport it's like it's actually the opposite sure. you have so much uh, medical support around you and you are conditioned hopefully mm. to be able to prevent those injuries well so okay so reversing out of breaking necks for a second um <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, sorry to just talk about that with you um not at all i, Love it. I, I guess well, i'm also intrigued with so as a rugby player you traveled around the world Yes. Playing in France, 
Australia, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scotland, Wales, Wales, Wales. Uh, in all the highest competitions that are still going on today, mm-hmm. winning trophies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, uh, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't almost. Oh, you lost in the semi-final. Yeah, a couple of semi-finals, but uh, okay. Carry on. Okay. I'm so, okay. With that, so with that said, um, that is from someone who's just starting to play a sport to then, you know, right. the rewards of traveling around the world. And, yeah. uh, what, uh, and this is a tricky question because it's not sa- the same for every sport, of course. But are there like a few things that you think would help people who are just kind of curious as to, well, when I make that decision or when I start mm. making progress towards this professional realm, what are the things I have to look out for? I mean, I'm imagining like getting management or an mm-hmm. agent of some sort. Mm-hmm. And and again, this is fast forwarding from a beginner, but still. Yeah. Um, we've spoken about the mental side of things a, a lot. I feel like, you know, even, you know, money. Make, you know, how much of where you played, for example, was, oh, I'd like to go to France. What a nice spot. I heard it's great in summer. Or mm. is it career strategy? If I go to France, I can earn this much. Therefore, it'll help me do this. Or I can go to France. I'll get noticed by this team. Mm. Is it... It's a very tricky question because it's different for everyone. But. It's a, it's it's an amazing question and it's there's so many levels and if we've got the time I can break it down to my best ability because as you're saying this I'm like yes yes I have a lot of great insight into that and some some uh, advice for people I guess that that are getting into that phase. So if we go back to I think the question you asked is like that that pivotal moment is like when did you know you were gonna yeah play professional sport and and we didn't mention this but from rugby league I shifted into rugby union which is another code which wasn't professional at the time mm. I played rugby union at high school and I started to see the opportunities now this is the crucial part of this answer um money was you know there on offer as rugby league I could leave school and go and in fact I got six offers from professional rugby league teams oh, wow. to go and be contracted as, as a rookie and get on real adult money. And, and they get a lot of kids that way that, that lure them into that. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, but I didn't go that route. I started to see the opportunities that rugby union offered. You mentioned travel, mm. world travel, something that I loved. And when I played rugby union with my high school team, I did play for the Australian schools team. And every four years, they do this amazing tour of the UK. Mm -hmm. So here I am as an 18-year-old, maybe even 17, turned 18, traveling to five different countries for eight weeks Mm -hmm. with a group of lads and met uh, stayed with families at that age. You you know you don't necessarily stay with hotels, so you get billeted. Sure. You you got billeted, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. So what an experience yep. is my point. And coming back from that, when I had a choice to go and get put on a contract, play rugby league, which I thought I wanted as a kid, mm. I'm now thinking of, you know. There's not a lot of travel. I did want to go to university. My fear of playing rugby league and just turning professional straight away is I'd learned from asking. Mm. That's the thing. Get curious. Ask mentors. Get Ask your support. Ask people that have done it. Uh, I got the impression that you, you, you were owned and that there wasn't a lot of opportunity for you to go to university, get a degree, which I wanted to do. Rugby union allowed that. It hadn't turned professional yet. Sure enough, I said nope. I said no to the rugby league contracts. I stuck with rugby union. I went to university. Rugby union turned professional in 1996. This yep. was 1994 when I left high school. So it was, it was being talked about. Anyway, back to my advice is ask yourself again, why do I want to be a professional athlete? Mm. What am I going to get from it? What possibilities will it give me? And get honest with yourself of your intention. Sure. Is it fame? And that's okay. Just understand the pitfalls of that. Is it money? And for many, especially we see in the NFL, coming from low socioeconomic backgrounds, okay. for many athletes, that's their ticket out because mm-hmm. they see money and fame. Mm. They're not seeing the pitfalls of that. My advice is to look at everything else that that particular chosen sport can offer you that can provide you an amazing human experience, apart from just the recognition which appeals to our ego, apart Mm. from just the money which affords us a certain lifestyle. Mm. Travel was a big one for me. 
So I chose rugby because I knew it was played in many more countries than rugby league. And it almost goes back to the, the question of how do you maintain having fun on a field when there's so much pressure and this cauldron of professionalism and... Yeah, maybe I might have missed it earlier, but it seems we did though. actually. We didn't. Di- I mean, we didn't really dive into that because there are many ways. And and again, part of this advice. Sorry to cut you off, no. but it's a great question. When you're in it, how do you manage it? Is you take a, an overall well-rounded approach from the beginning, foundation. Well, from the beginning, it'd be great, but I find that that's not what happens. Ah. It, athletes get to that level, and they're like. Whew, this is harder than I thought, uh-huh. right? And as you mentioned, it gets to a point where it's like, this is a grind. This I was 20 or 19 or 21. I got my contract. This is amazing. Playing in big stadiums, that's all enjoyable for different reasons. Mm. You get to 27 and 28 after your fifth surgery. I'm not saying this happens to everyone. Mm. Or <laughs> some guys have families mm. and they don't get recontracted or re-signed with the club. They've just put their kids in a new school, by the way. I saw this happen many times. And then their contract gets discontinued, so I'm still able to play. Where can I play? Oh, there's an offer over in Limerick and Ireland now. Mm -hmm. I better take it. There's no other offers. So they take the kids out of school, and that's hard for families, right? So that's a consideration too. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's – I'm not saying that's impossible – but weigh it all up, and that's where support's important. That becomes now support from your from your partner. Love it. If they're involved as well, which they are often, mm-hmm. and it puts a strain on relationships as well. It's like I've seen it. I could we could go right into that, but that's just scratching the surface. That's one of the elements of why do I want to do this? What am I prepared for? The pitfalls of this. Can I handle it? Can my family handle it? If I have a family, and um, and what's the payoff? That's the thing. And, and my advice is don't just make it about the money. Don't just make it about the recognition and the fame. That's all ego. Wow. I really, I think that's great. I mean, you've answered sort of so many questions in one I hope so. True consideration, it yeah. seems, is probably the, one of the key aspects to being able to enjoy a career no matter how long or short. Yeah, because you keep connecting back to why I'm doing it. Just like any profession. Yeah. Any profession. Mm-hmm. You did a fire side on photography. Mm-hmm. Why do I want to be a photographer? And and once you get set on that and it's still exciting to you and you understand the, the pitfalls of it, it's like, that's okay. Mm. I'll take the pitfalls because what it's going to give me, man, that's worth it. That's and great. Then we talk about sacrifice. It's like, that's okay because it's worth it. Well, you mentioned careers before as well and yours ended prematurely. Mm-hmm. Um, how old were you? Yeah, it was somewhat premature. Okay. Fortunately, I was coming to the end. I was 32. Okay. I turned... It was on my 32nd birthday. I woke up in hospital on no my way. birthday, yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, these careers, it's almost seeming, I could be wrong, but they seem as a, depending on the sport, they're getting shorter and shorter, especially physical mm. contact. Mm. And I know that you speak a lot um, and help individuals and teams uh, around this idea of um, what happens after the career, yes. post-career. Now, again, uh, m- maybe there are people watching who are in the middle of a career. Which is which are fantastic, and maybe this is it seems very relevant right now, but maybe it's something that could be considered earlier too. When's too early to start thinking about what you do after your career? Because you were thirty two, mm. so maybe for a rugby player that's towards the end, as you say. But mm-hmm. in life, you've still got another seventy odd years. So when it may sound ridiculous, and tell me if I do, but is there is is there ever a time that's not too early to? start thinking about what happens after and how do you get that support or knowledge well a you never sound ridiculous thank you very much b i'm i love this i'm so passionate about this because i've been through it it's never too early okay simple answer it's never too early in fact that's part of my mission now in my practice is to get this kind of everything we're talking about is to educate young up and coming athletes as early as possible yep. at least plant the seed and maybe, just maybe, we talk about the support. Choose your support wisely. And when I say that, I'm thinking specifically of agents, sports agents, sport managers, because that is a crucial part of a developing athlete is mm. that guidance. It's like an 18-year-old isn't going to be able to walk into the, the head coach's office and the director of sport and the owner of the club, if it's a private club, and mm. negotiate their own contract. 
and walk out of there a winner. So you need an agent, but choose an agent that's, again, more than just that. What other support can you give me? What other guidance can you give me? So these agents or sports managers should also be telling you, hey, by the way, average age in your position in this sport, your the career will end in seven years or three years. Um, this is what you should consider on the other side, like financial management. I saw that uh, Patrick Mahomes just bought a stake in yeah. his local baseball team. So he's yeah. investing his money. Yeah. Um, that should be, the managers should be telling you that stuff. They, they, it's not about should. I mean, they, they definitely, I don't know if I, they have a duty or a responsibility, but I, if, if I'm a parent and my son or daughter is on the verge of stardom and professionalism, I would want the, her representation to have the player's best interest in yeah. mind as well. So yeah. that's a little tip for like when you're choosing an agent, when you're choosing a manager, again, look beyond just how much money can you get me? Mm. What endorsement deals can you get me? All important stuff. But maybe there's what kind of personal attention are you going to give me? Because that can be a lure as well of there are big agencies that have big, let's say, oh, uh, they represent Patrick Mahomes. Mm. Oh, i got to go with them because they must be good. Sure. What can happen there, and it happens all the time, is yes, you sign with them, they get you a good contract, you only hear from them every time it's contract time. Yeah, and that to me isn't representation. That's just doing your deal, and that that helps. But it's it's about, and that's why I I actually help agencies become more um, appealing. Agencies is like, what else can you offer your athletes, and mm. I can support you offer your athlete support, and that's just gonna put you head and shoulders above the other agents. Anyway, we won't go into that, but it's what was it, what was the question well, again uh, about? Well, it was sort of about... Um, oh, how young is too young? How young is too young? And then an add on to that mm -hmm. is, um, should so yes, great if you have the support and the advice from management, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But is it also on you, the athlete, the budding athletes, to also make sure that they maintain, you know, their interests outside of a sport? Because it's obviously all, yes. all consuming, but should they get, wow, I've always liked reading. I've always liked numbers. Therefore, I, I've always been interested in science, you know, whatever mm. it is. And so they should keep that up so that when the career ends, they, they are well-versed and educated in certain other things which they can leapfrog into. And again, this is, it's easier said than done. Of course. Imagine you're 20 years old and you've got stars in your eyes and all of a sudden you have everybody that wants you and you sign a big deal and you're in the press and you're in the – and you, it feels great. Mm. Uh, try and tell that person, this isn't going to last long, so let's start planning for when it happens. Not if it happens, but when it happens. <clears throat> More often than not, that athlete is going to be like, just let me enjoy this and uh, I just, I'll, I'll worry about that when it happens. The most common attitude. Right. So the challenge is how do we how do we send the message to these young athletes that is compelling enough that actually makes them think, actually, yeah, that's that's right. I should, knowing that it's not. Yes, they have a responsibility on themselves, but just understanding that more often than not, they're just going to probably put everything into that sport and be the best that they can be, and, mm. and worry about it when they they think they're going to last forever. Mm. So. The question is, how can we provide that support and the resources? And this is what I'm this is what I'm up to today. Is I believe it should be, and it's starting to happen with coaches and teams and sports administrations. I feel like there's a responsibility on them um, to start giving them resources and planting the seed, uh, bringing in financial literacy programs, right. and teams are doing it but it's seen as kind of like a secondary thing i believe it should be part of their training regime and your own transition has led you into spearheading that which it, is interesting it, it, and and fantastic my own transition going through what i went through knowing that i would have handled that transition better had i like i said if i knew then what i knew now and started working on and to a degree sebastian you make a great point and it's so important to do things outside we're avoiding burnout when we take on other interests. Mm. And I think it needs to go beyond just playing video games and switching off, mm. which has its benefits and has its merit. Uh, rather than that, it's like, how can I not just switch off, but how can I stimulate and engage oh, yeah. other parts of my brain and build on? Because you talk about self-doubt. A lot of the self-doubt comes from just how we are as an individual, as a human. We can work on our self-esteem and self-confidence 
in other ways and build that that transfers into our sport and not just pin it solely on am I good at this sport or not? Did I make a mistake or not? And when I do make a mistake, I'm worthless. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeless. I don't want to make that mistake again, therefore I'm not going to try. Get out and do other things. Stimulate the creativity. It not only helps you um, recharge, but now you're starting to prepare yourself probably without even knowing it. And that's my angle. Rather than coming in and leading with, your sport's going to end one day, what are you doing about it now? Mm. I'm just enjoying my time as a sportsman. How about this? You're a sportsman right now and you want to be a better sportsman, you want to be a better teammate, you want to be a better athlete, then there are ways you can work on stuff outside your sport, sorry, outside your sport and you develop as a human and your mindset and your creativity and it's going to make you a better athlete. How does that sound? I love it. I'm a true believer of that. Mm. And then by default, then when they retire, they're like, actually, I, I picked up a quite a few life skills there. Mm. And, and because I, was, I started a foundation, you see a lot of athletes do it. I started a foundation. Mm. That felt really good. I was giving back already. And, and I learned things outside my sport and I developed as a human. That's going to help you transition. Great answer. <laughs> I, I like, I, I love it, and I obviously love what you're up to. Now, you know, um, again, for people watching, because this is why we do these firesides, mm -hmm. um, making sacrifices, knowing that not to sacrifice everything, including mm -hmm. your happiness. In fact, staying happy and knowing what you want to do mm -hmm. in addition to a sport is, is crucial. And, and can I say, jump in? Please. Because that word is key, and that word is the backbone of what you do and your story. 100 right. things, happiness. What's going to bring me happiness and joy? And connect to that. Is this sport going to bring me happiness and joy and why? Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. What is it? Write it down. Because like I said, and you just mentioned it, if you're just chasing the fame and the accolades and the recognition because it might make us feel accepted, and I did that for a long time. I, I was playing rugby, uh, not... I wasn't tapped into or connected to that little boy that just loved rolling around the dirt and playing with mates and feeling, you know, feeling great when I when I scored and stuff like that. It was it was um, this is giving me recognition and acceptance by my peers and people, and I love the reaction of people when they when I tell them I play rugby. It's it's and and not going into it, but there was also identifying with masculinity and stuff like that. That's a whole other conversation. My point is. I wasn't necessarily connected to mm -hmm. what you can establish early. Sure. And that is, why do I want to be a professional sportsman? I love that. Let's break it down, you know? And then I, you spoke about hard work. Mm -hmm. Hard work is the thing that allowed you to progress to the elite level. I wasn't Not the most talented. Such an uh, I could have just fallen away. And one more thing. I'm sorry to keep bringing stuff up. But oh, this no, is also let's relive important. it. Let's, let's go. <laughs> well, this is so important and this held me back and it continues to hold me back in certain areas that I'm working on just, on just breaking through. And everyone does this in their life in general. But this is where it's, I think it can be developed in sport is comparison. I wanted to jump in when you were, you were saying early on about sort of the sacrifice and what we need to do as an athlete and the journey that we're on and, and, and heading into professionalism. And one of the things I didn't mention that I wanted to was when we start comparing, when we start looking at other teammates, when we start looking at opposition players, when we start looking at what they have and what they've achieved and what, and I did that mm. right up until the end of my career, in fact, and only after my career was I able to look back in and say, eh, that held me back a lot. Mm is when you stop comparing and stop wanting to be like them, sure, we can use it as motivation, but always coming back to that growth mindset, am I better than yesterday? Am I better than yesterday? How am I doing? Not I've worked my tail off and I'm still not as talented or I'm still not getting the TV interviews or I'm still not getting paid as much as that teammate. That's a killer. Comparison's a killer. That is a killer. It's It's... What are you doing? How are you improving? How, what did you learn from today? What did you learn from yesterday? How are you managing this disappointment so that you can move forward and celebrate that? Mm. Celebrate it. Celebrate yeah. growing every single day. Mm. So I think we've, I think we've gone through the full gamut from uh, ambitious youngster yeah. who has a love for a sport, 
all the way through to managing a professional career and even post career, which is a lot to to take up in an interview, and you've yeah. done magnificently. And oh, thank you. I hope so. Um, thank you. I kind of have this image that the person watching or listening right now might be a younger kid, yeah. and uh, and they've got a, a scent of what they want to do, this dream, this ambition. Um, I, I'd let, maybe this is this is the last question I'll ask of you. Mm. What do you say to that younger kid? What do you say to your younger self um, as uh, I don't know a form of support if that person doesn't have it? What is the one liner to them? Oh, uh, what do you love? Which sport do you love? Why do you love it? And go and get it and enjoy. I mean, I think that encapsulate that encapsulates. Oh, and one last thing, you youngster watching right now. Your sport and what you do and your achievements don't define who you are. That's not who you are. It's just a thing that you do that gives you a great life experience. But don't forget who you are. Oh, I love that. <laughs> what a way to wrap up. I'm glad Mate, you did. Thank you so much for your time. You are awesome. Oh, Back at you, Seb. Thanks for the opportunity. I love it.